All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. <laughs> I'm just, that was a really bad joke. Okay, um, we're going to introduce our, uh, our next uh, group of experts here. So this group consists of three people, but I'm just going to bring on uh, Andrew Sinkinson. He's at StatsCan, and he is going to be blowing your mind. So here you go. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Singerson. I'm from uh, StatsCan. I work with our uh, in solution uh, delivery, and as part of that, I have many uh, open source teams. And I'm happy to report that open source is alive and well at StatsCan. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff. We're um, we're going to have uh, I'm going to introduce uh, my co-speakers is uh, William Hearn. He's an open source developer. Um, you'd probably best know William for the work that he's done on the WXT Drupal distribution. So this is an open source software that's built in the open, uh, shared with many organizations. Uh, Will's also leading um, a lot of our, he's doing a lot of our cloud strategy. So at StatsCan, we're going full cloud for our um, infrastructure. Um, we're not just simply doing a lift and shift. We're going to be actually containerizing. We're going to be orchestrating. So Will's going to get into some of those cool things that we're doing with the cloud. Um, beside William is Laurent Godard. So, Laurent has been, has been doing open, is also an open source development, or developer. He's been developing an open source for quite a long time. Probably, uh, I think he's been part of, you'd know him best from the Web Experience Toolkit. Uh, he's been participating there before it even existed on GitHub. So he's been there for quite a while. And uh, he's on my data visualization team. So he's going to talk a bit about how we're using data visualization in open source. So I'll let uh, William get uh, started, and he's going to go through his uh, slide pack. Testing this. All right, I just want to say hi, I'm Will. Um, everyone hates when I do this, but it makes me feel better. I'm super shy about presenting, so just uh, give me a, bear with me and we'll try to get through this together. We have a lot to go through. I'll try to maintain my, my, my rate of speech, but we'll see how it goes. Oh, okay, try to be a bit better. So, hi there. This is a fun presentation for me because I get to talk about some of the open source work being done at StatsCan. Uh, but more than that, I get to talk about a philosophy that has been working its way into the department and what appears to soon be the broader government as a whole. Um, if there's any open government people, I just wanted to say quickly that you are the best and I've been really excited with what you guys have done with our Drupal work we've tossed off to you. All right, so let's go. All right. So I'm an open source developer, of, um, I'm not going to say how many years, and I'm currently working as a cloud engineer for the cloud operations team at StatsCan. In my past, I've worn many hats, but primarily pe some people know me from Drupal, the Drupal community, a platform which incidentally powers both StatsCan, the open data portal, as well as about 20 plus departments across the GOC. Uh, I've been very lucky throughout my life to be a part of some amazing open source communities, particularly because I've been able to grow so much as a developer and meet some amazing friends throughout. As a personal note, I can't really describe how it feels when you get to interact with one of your heroes in a GitHub issue. Uh, for me, it was Jesse Friz Frizzell from Docker, Tina Gravi, also from Docker, Brandon Phillips from CoreOS, Angie Byron from Drupal, Jonathan Pulsifier from Shopify, and Daniel Tomsej from Traffic. Um, it's been, if, you, if you get one thing from me during this talk, is I hope that, uh, uh, that you can understand that I wholeheartedly believe it is truly all about the community. Um, and then Laurence is going to do a quick, brief introduction. Oh, it's my intro. Yeah. So my name is Laurent Gadaire, and as uh, Andrew said before, I was the lead de developer for the Web Experience Toolkit, and I am also a, now, a member of the Node.js Node Foundation as an official maintainer for the uh, Docker Node. Uh, so we've incorporated a lot of uh, Node into our, uh, our stack. All right. All right. So Statistics Canada has been increasing in its use of open source tech over the past few years and is poised to make bigger changes over the next several, which I'm very excited about and will detail over the coming slides. One of the more interesting things, though, about this department, at least in my experience, is that it encourages developers to contribute back to their respective community um, and has even permitted some teams, such as the Drupal team, to develop completely their software in the open on GitHub. Um, actually, it's a very special team, and it has been doing just that for over five plus years. I believe we were the first department to actually open source all of our stuff on GitHub. We did it roughly around the same time as WetBow, uh, so that's very interesting. 
Um, some of you might find this to be a bit counterintuitive at first. I mean, where is the direct benefit back to the department? Uh, I'm going to let us ponder that one for a moment while I continue onwards. The suspense or whatever. All right, let's go. So um, I'm aware of quite a few teams leveraging front-end toolkits such as Angular, React, Vue.js, D3, performing progressive enhancement on a variety of our web applications. Uh, AngularJS is actually leveraged for upcoming search pages. Uh, React.js is used for our Canvas portal, which we're hoping to open source fairly, fairly shortly. Vue.js is actually used for generating some of our front-end SaaS code. I won't get into what SaaS is. It will it'll take a, kind of a long time. Uh, D3.js for our data visualizations, which in about for two to five minutes you'll soon hear from Laurent. Um, I just want to make actually a, a brief mention about Laurent. And this goes towards a bit about open source in general. Uh, I met Laurent, Laurent through the Web Experience Toolkit repository, and ever since he has ta taught me actually kind of a lot. Incidentally, without his help, the wet bow integration with platforms such as Drupal would have been much harder. Um, basically, I want to show you that meeting new friends is commonplace in open source communities. Um, finally, close to my heart is we have a stellar web content management systems team um, and slash maintainers who have been using Drupal for the past five years, and all of whom, as I said earlier, mentioned uh, developed completely in the open. Next, we have a search team that continues to use Apache Solar, the open source enterprise search platform built on Apache Lucene, uh, for much of our search and web pages. Though I should mention, the search team and some other ones are also looking at Elasticsearch, mostly from a monitoring perspective via the Elk stack. Uh, what is perhaps the most exciting, though, is the amount of teams we, as the cloud operations team, assist with moving towards microservices by first containerizing their applications. We have various teams doing this, so rather than mention acronyms, I will just mention the programming language, which is perhaps the most relevant detail anyways. Um, so we have C Sharp, .NET. You might actually notice we do a lot of Windows. Windows is fully compliant with containerization. Microsoft has taken this kind of the, the full way for us. I'll even mention later a bit of a white paper that shows all the process for people that are interested. And then back into the Linux world, we have JavaScript, Node.js, Java, Golang, Python, PHP, SAS, Data. These are all containerized, and we're actively trying to take these towards production in our department. Um, finally, as an organization, we, along with every cloud vendor, are taking quite a thorough look at what a, what a pretty awesome person says is the operating system of the cloud. The answer um, is pretty much Kubernetes, um, which makes me pretty happy most days. So then we're just going to go into uh, some of the contributions that we've made as a department. Um, so open source doesn't really exist without a community and contributions to sustain it. Uh, interestingly, as once you start using open source as an agency, you realize in order to maximize your benefits, you often need to contribute back. You need to get yourself known in the community and make friendships. You have a more likelihood of someone going out of their way to help you because of that. Uh, you will increase your own competence by engaging with the community and you will stay up to date with the latest changes and you'll even have an ability to shape the product and align it with your own department's vision because you are actually active in, in the inside community. Some of the things, and I'll just gloss over this fairly quickly, is we've given a lot of uh, improvements to the Bootstrap framework from Laurent and to WetBow. Uh, pretty much a lot of our developers have submitted uh, quite a few patches to it. Laurent was one of the main developers, again, of it. Uh, Drupal, we've actually, this is kind of a success story. Uh, we developed a web, Drupal Web Experience Toolkit platform that has been shared and leveraged by many other government departments, 20 plus, I'll mention all of them in a second, even provincial ones, as well as municipalities. Incidentally, StatCamp played a significant role in the development of the Open Data, Open Government Initiative, which saw improvements being made to both CCAN and Drupal upstream. The team actually won the Public Service Excellence Award because of it. And uh, even just this year, Open Data won the UK Award in 2018, just a few months ago. And then finally, we submitted new, numerous patches against Drupal Core and countless contributed modules, helping the community as a whole. Um, we've also done some contributions to Docker. So we've done uh, contributions to the official Drupal and Node.js image, as Laura mentioned. We're also sharing our approach to containerization with other departments. And then finally, of Kubernetes, I think we've con contributed about five to six Helm charts. And they're not, not all of them are officially in, but there are, there are pull requests, and I will talk about them briefly. And we are trying to share our approach to Kubernetes with other departments, as I really believe it is a, it is a driver for app delivery um, for everyone. And then we have data visualizations, which are for public use and are right now on our StackCan GitHub repository for everyone to take a look at. And then finally, one of the last things we actually do is we host a monthly CNCF cloud meetup, uh, which is GOC-centric, and we get to work with the amazing people at CDS. And seriously, no joke, uh, these are some of the most knowledgeable people, knowledgeable people you could ever meet uh, hosting the monthly group. Um, and then finally, I just want to say, this might be a useful point to mention here that the agency actively seeks out open source developer talent. 
And then finally, I'll probably just go through this quickly as I'm taking a bit longer. I just wanted to quickly mention that we realized early on there's a, there's a lot of benefit to leveraging open source. It brings with it a significant return of investment. For instance, when you develop in the open, your code is of higher quality and usually goes through some sort of linting, building through CI, whether it's Circle, Travis, etc. Uh, more focus is placed on security and abstraction, and you have the ability for others to peer review and improve your code. And then probably really interesting is that you can attract developer talent. Um, Open source developers actually have a range of options and choices, and the first thing they will do when looking at an organization, whether they want to go there, is what are the public repos, what kind of code are they doing, can I see myself being there based on that. This is how you attract quality talent. Um, for instance, thanks to Laurent's D3JS work, we are getting an exceptional data visualization exp expert that is studied at MIT. And for myself, thanks to some of the Drupal's team's open source work, we managed to snag quite a few brilliant developers straight out of some universities such as Waterloo. and not today private companies because they didn't get the chance to grab them. Um, so who is personally the most, these, some of these people are personally the most knowledgeable developers I've ever worked with. Um, and these type of talent coming into your department drive new energy and innovation. So I'm just going to toss this off to Laurent to talk briefly about DataViz. Thank you. Thank you, Will. The data visualization team at StatScan is fairly new and fairly small. When we started off, we were only two. Uh, people and we were delivering on census data vis with only two months per project to deliver So needless to say that open source and open format have been a key part of delivering those uh, open source I mean these delivering these projects and as uh, next, sli next slide as um, oh, keep going. As do Dr. Fielding said before the importance in open source is the community but that also means external community that you, that's not yours. So if you want your developers to stay current and get free training, you should encourage them to go in the open source community and contribute back. So that will allow them to stay up to date on the on technology. It will help them learn new languages, but also soft skills, how to negotiate, how to properly report problems, how to work with other people, and sometimes it's people around the world, how do you, do you work in different time zones? A lot of skills that you can only acquire truly when you work in an open source stack. As Will said before, you can attract a lot of talent, and we're really excited for our first uh, uh, open source person that actually found us through our GitHub organization, looked up the contribution we did to the community, and decided that they wanted to work with us. That's really exciting. And if I can share uh, one anecdote, um, the most significant contribution I have made in open source were actually two lines of code that took me maybe two weeks to figure out. When we started off with Node, uh, no one in the government could use the Node package manager because of her insane network configurations. And I banged my head against the wall for two weeks and I found those, those hacks and I submitted that because there was actually an, uh, an issue on GitHub about people having problems with proxies around the world. So I posted those two lines and that really took off. It landed in the documentation and to this day, every month or so, I get a thank you email from people around the world taking me of how many hours I, I saved them. So you, get, you give back to the community, you help your organization and you learn a lot more. And then, uh, next slide. The open format, that's the more difficult part of the equation. Uh, this is a space that StatScan is a bit new in, but StatScan to remain uh, relevant has to become a source of information among others. We're not the only one. And to really become relevant, we have to allow our users to use our data with other data to truly get some, uh, some broader context. And we can only do that by, doing, uh, by using open format. And by using open format, we make our data so much more easy to understand. So to go back to our open, stack, open source stack, next slide. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, Docker as was mentioned before, for us it is a no-brainer because not only it, it works for the server side for our, our deploying application, but it also helps us, uh, our developers, get up to speed. We can create a lot of uh, shareable tools 
And then instead of, instead of taking a, a week for a new uh, a student or a new developer, we can uh, get them started in a matter of hours. Node.js is also a no-brainer because most of the uh, JavaScript front-end tools run on Node. And the benefit of using Node is that we only need to, to acquire a JavaScript developer. We don't need any other language. Our entire stack is in the same language, so that makes uh, hiring people a lot simpler. And when it comes to the meat and bones of data viz, there's, only, there's more to it than that, but the two core ones we're using is RD3 and i18 and nx. i18 and nx is, is a simpler one, so it's, it just allows us to create uh, data viz visualizations that are uh, translatable. So we only, uh, because of our policy, we only uh, uh, provide English and French, but anyone can fork our, our data viz and provide translation very easily. Which brings us to D3. Who here has heard of D3? Okay, quite a, fight, a fair bit of people. The power in D3 is, uh, the analogy I use is that it's the open GL of gaming, but in data visualization. It does not give you anything, it only gives you tools to build data, data visualization. And how you use those tools is up to you. And the, the, the way that the government of Canada and Statistics Canada in particular can contribute to that space is made data visualization that are accessible natively and do not require the use of uh, textual alternative to make them interactive as easily for someone with mobility issues or, or uh, uh, visual issues as anyone else. And that's something we're, we're going to be investigating in the near future. We have uh, uh, a base, we just released, as um, uh, Will mentioned earlier, we just released a list of components, and in the coming months we'll be uh, integrating accessibility improvements directly in those components. And that will be our contribution to the field of data visualization. Next slide. And when it comes to open format, uh, these, nothing in here is, is new. Uh, Schema.org has already been mandated for in the standard of web interoperability, but we're looking at uh, pushing it further and applying to data, not just web pages, so that we can uh, have uh, data formats that are predictable and use a standardized vocabulary. And the same for, for JSON API and, and JSON LD. And also StatScan uses a lot of, of uh, formats like countries and languages. So adopting international standard when available instead of customized standard internally will allow our data to be more compatible with data from other sources. Back to you, Will. All right. So there is a quote I like from the creator of Drupal, Dries Bartart. It's really the Drupal community and not so much the software that makes the Drupal project what it is. So fostering the Drupal community is actually more important than just managing the code base. Um, this is because the Drupal community has perhaps the most passionate user base around which constantly helps to develop, maintain, and create new Drupal functionality while adhering to high technical standards of UX, architecture, and accessibility. It should also be reminded that Drupal is and always will be free and that the platform will always be available at no cost. And one uh, need only compare this with other content management systems that can cost hundreds and thousands of dollars to purchase and license while still only having a fraction of the functionality that is in Drupal 8. Um, finally, if you look back at Drupal's history, the platform also does a great job of addressing security issues. A bulletin is released to Drupal users whenever there is an issue with the platform or when there are updates, to f or when there are updates provided to fix something. Additionally, there's a dedicated Drupal security team that works to monitor potential security risks, risks. and actually as of all Drupal 8, uh, as of now, all Drupal 8 modules that are approved in the process automatically get security scans every day. Uh, some people worry whether an open source system is easier to hack. The reality is though, is that with a team of users and dedicated security experts, it is likely the best defense you can have. Uh, so I'm only going to talk about Drupal at a high level as I have a fair amount to go through. Um, there's a full demonstration at 3.30 being given by Robin Gallipo showing Drupal using the Web Experience Toolkit with Apache Solar, so I encourage you to take a look then. Uh, the following just represents some bullet points of the features I consider important, but it might be better to split it up by persona. Uh, so I'm only going to talk briefly about this, but for content authors, there is often a range of concerns, but at top of mind is probably accessibility. You're in luck though, because Drupal, particularly Drupal 8, is the most accessible CMS content management framework without exception. There are many instances in Drupal 8 where it has been able to provide more semantic HTML5 elements, which assistive technology will be able to leverage. 
Um, then thanks for the mobile first. You also have that every single theme and even the administration bar is responsive by design. Um, it was optimized for mobile. Most impressively though is Drupal is extensively multilingual and supports over 154 languages where you can assign a language to every possible context in the system. You will also benefit from the automated downloads and updates of official translations. Uh, th these will never override your protected local ones in case you were concerned. And finally for content, you can even get field level configurability and fine grained per language content access. Um, then we even have for, con for content especially, and every entity in Drupal, there is built-in revision support and improved moderation transition handling. And thanks to the deploy suite of modules, uh, you can even easily deploy your content across Drupal sites via REST. This is important for more restrictive environments like StatsCan, where the content isn't actually allowed to reside on the database in production, even if it's behind a draft status until the approved time. Um, deployment is actually really neat in Drupal 8 as it allows you to have things like cross-site content staging, content branching via Git, uh, via a Git-like paradigm I should say, workspaces for your site to preview, and offline browse and publish capabilities. I encourage you to take a look at drupaldeploy.org, but just very briefly, I'm going to try to quickly run through this, which shows an example of the deploy wor of uh, workspaces preview plus deployment. So we'll see how this goes. That's bad. So what we're doing here is we just have our base site. We're going to pr prepare our, our microsite updates. You can see that we have a few workspaces, such as home space edits, uh, some new news articles. We have a one about the flu season campaign. And what you can see is workspaces actually have their own workspace status. So this was under draft. So we can't, because it's under draft, we can't immediately push to production. But if we go just in a second, I have to follow along as we go here. This draft two. What he's going to do, I don't know doing that, yeah, perfect. So now we're into our, our product microsite updates, which actually is ready for deployment. This is just a transition on our moderation. And because of that, we can deploy this entirely to another Drupal site. This is just showing you here all the ones that are ready for deployment, which is flag any second. And then we can actually pick any one of these. And what we can do is actually preview it locally. Say we like that, it's working on our staging environment. We can then, as I fast forward, we'll just do this. Da, da, da. I'm going to have to play with the videos a bit. So we can actually deploy to production here. We can send a message. And what it's going to do is actually going to make sure the content can sync over to the production namespace. This is making sure that the content types are aligned via schema. We have a strong type schema for every, every field in Drupal. So it's going to check that it can successfully merge. But what you should also notice, if I just missed that, it's going to be hard to find. Ah, so close. One more time. Is that? We actually did a successful deployment, and by us pausing this, it actually deployed 76 nodes, all the users related to it, the five menu items also related, and the nine taxonomy terms, so that your whole content architecture actually comes with it. What it's doing behind the scenes is since everything in Drupal is handled by, um, by, by a schema in YAML, it's actually sending the YAML constructs over to the, to the production site and making sure the content can align with it. Very useful, and it, it just works. So I'm going to go outside here for that. All right, uh, because of time, I'm just going to skip over the developer section, but there's a rich set of data, mod data modeling, config management, ACL, uh, web services, so you can do things like, like progressive enhancement. In fact, a lot of people in Drupal right now, they're getting rid of their front end, front end and handling it in Twig. And instead what they're using is a thing called JSON API or GraphQL, and they're using Drupal's rich entity system to actually expose everything via JSON, and then they're letting front enders get complete control over the markup by just, just handling, it, handling it themselves, which actually is remarkably freeing. Uh, obviously you still probably need to maintain your Twig templates, so if people that does, do have JavaScript disabled, you have to make sure you're still accessible, but Drupal is incredibly forward thinking and in a sense API first because of this. So now we're just going to go very quickly into, just one second, no, oh, we're good, we're good. All right. I think it's just getting loose, one, there we go. All right, so in Drupal 7 we had that we at StatsCan contributed the WXT framework which actually has a five plus year operational track record. Um, it has 20 departments leveraging it. It has national collaboration with some provinces and municipalities. It's been an incredibly stable platform for development for the past five years and it has full blown WET4 implementation. Uh, in, in Drupal 8 we'll be doing a WET5 one but this is uh, just very quickly showing what we did in Drupal 7 and there were actually a lot of lessons learned though I should mention. Just gonna give me a second to grab it. Uh, so these are all the departments that at some point still are or currently or did use the, use the Drupal 7 variant. Uh, that would be, I won't go through them all, but Industry Canada, Health Canada, Treasury Board, FinTrack, Veterans Affairs, CTA, Buy and Sell, um, Canadian Air Transport Authority, City, City of Hamilton, 
uh, PMO, PCO. So we did pretty good for a team of about roughly between five to ten developers over the last five years. I say that's kind of a success story. We were hoping that we would have been the one officially chosen by the government. Uh, things are going well apparently now for this year and with open, the Open First initiative. So we're aiming high for the, the years to come. Uh, so I'm just going to go very quickly over to Drupal 8. Um, so before I talk about uh, the WXT framework at Drupal 8, uh, I mentioned there were some lessons learned in Drupal 7, and that was we can't do all the work ourselves. Um, so what we did in Drupal 8 is we leveraged the Lightning framework, to actually, which uh, core mission is to enable developers to create great authoring experiences and empower editorial teams. It gives you a minimal opt in design. It's extensively tested and secured with that by Acquia, which is the flagship company for Drupal. Um, it's actually the one that Dries Bytard himself works for. He's the CAO for it, and it targets several key functional areas, including media, layout, workflow, and is completely API first. Uh, so I'm just going to show very quickly what uh, an example, what, uh, how quickly you can build the layout. Um, we didn't get a chance to show um, our variant because I had to bring up a, a few slides, but ours actually has all this functionality, and it gives you alignment to all the Government of Canada information architecture specs. So you can just quickly just choose the layout you want and actually build it all in front of you via the UI. So I'm just going to show that very quickly. So we're just going to log in. So what we're doing here is we're just creating a simple landing page. We can call it whatever we want, diving in. Uh, we created a little paragraph, and then we're just going to set up, make, save it directly, and then it's going to go a bit further. Uh, probably going a bit too far for that. So we're just going to go to our layout portion. What we can do in our layout is we can actually add individual components from the entire system. Um, what it does on the right-hand side is it lets us pick which components we want to add, whether it's through media itself. So with media, what we're going to do is just add a quick picture and just place it right in the layout. So I'll just call this, I don't know, just finally top banner. We're going to upload right here. We'll pick a picture, and then it will go. We have, uh, Drupal will automatically enforce alternative text. And then we, if we want to, we can even crop it or freeform it, but we're just going to save it directly. And then hopefully we'll just finally save. So we place it. And then it goes, we get a little preview. And then we're going to mark it as embedded because you get different types of view modes with Drupal. And then it just comes right in. But then we notice, well, the layout still probably needs a bit more work. So we're going to change it. And remember, again, I mentioned we already have support for the full GOCIA spec. So this is just regular Drupal core. But in us, you could pick the official layouts. Uh, so we, pick, we did that. We added a new section. You can see we're kind of actually driving the layout while we're building it. And then we're adding a nice visit us section. And then we can do, do a little address. And it's going to place a map block for us. And then hopefully that comes, that comes in, and it's great. So you kind of get the idea of how this works. And then the nice thing is, as I said, this is all backed by schema. So everything you do here, if you even had a blank Drupal site, you could dump the YAML, uh, the YAML which represents the content architecture, send it over to a new Drupal site, and you immediately get everything you just did. All, all, your, all your actual UI work is configuration as code. So I'm just going to skip over that now because it's roughly going to go a bit further into that. So then finally, again, to Drupal 8 WXT, which is a sub-profile of Lightning. Um, which relies on and integrates extensively with the WXT jQuery framework. So what we did here is we offloaded a lot of the, the, the nitty-gritty details of Drupal and we let Lightning handle it, where we now just focus on the wet integration and the accessibility stuff, which frees up a lot of our developers. So we support all of WXT themes, as I mentioned, improved layouts aligned to GOCIA spec. Um, just for people that didn't want the way to a full distribution, though, we do support wet WXT Bootstrap and Library as a standalone for people that just want to build their own Drupal but still use WetBow. And we ported the variety of WXT plugins directly inside WetBow for people to leverage. Uh, work is underway for Wet5, but it's still in the fairly uh, developmental stage. Um, so now what I'm going to talk about is open data, and I will show a few pages that I think are pretty nice for, from it, and just show how, how roughly two developers in a six-month time, time frame actually developed the whole open data front-end portal in Drupal. Um, it was done, it incorporates things such as user engagement, has many decoupled improvements, uh, has great CCAN solar integration, refined workflows, and improved search. So let's just take a look here at some of the pages. We're just going to flip out of here. I may, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to do both at the same time. We should be fine. Just need to get my links. All right, so we're just going to go. So I'm just going to show the main front end page. Nothing too fancy here. People have seen it. So we'll just go. Sorry it's on my, my tether, but... Not so bad. So this actually front page, you saw the layout manager in the, before. This is completely also managed by layout. So if the developer, if I logged in, I could change this layout myself very quickly to another eye spec. I could move blocks over. And the nice thing is Drupal has the concept of never repeating yourself. Um, these are actually dynamic blocks which are handled through views, which is kind of like, um, 
don't know how to explain views. It's like a SQL, SQL query engine, but more, more visual in how you use it. It makes it so even though you have content in other pages, you never really have to rewrite that same content to present it in a different way. So all we're doing is through a kind of SQL query, done, again, no SQL do you have to know. It will actually just render the titles themselves, pulling from the latest blog posts, showing the most recent 20. Um, and actually, I, while I mentioned blog, it's another thing we've also contributed and just gave to everyone. As soon as you use the variant, uh, the Drupal variant, you just get the blog functionality, all commenting, which is being used right now. So this entire blog system, commenting, um, approvals, and moderation throughout is being used through for, from the open government site. So we'll just pick one that has 25 users, 25 comments. We'll just go there quickly. And you can just see we get a nice little feed for that, and that works really well. Another nice thing, though, is I mentioned API first. If you wanted to, and I don't think Open Canada has actually enabled this, but you can actually expose all of these comments through a REST API and let people easily consume it. You don't have to do anything. You just enable JSON API, and it will instantly map all of our entity systems to those routes so you can use and actually do pretty complicated queries with. And then finally, I'm just going to go very quickly and just show the apps rating. Hopefully, I remember the address. Let's see how that goes. Come on, you. One second. I don't know what it's doing. All right. Uh, so this is surprisingly slow. Uh, so this is an apps page. It was actually powered in the back end by Solar. But what we did is we actually let, uh, we're using voting API. Uh, so it lets people vote on the specific apps themselves. This is neat, though, because in C with CCAN, in the old Drupal 7, we let CCAN have direct access to our database in order to get these metrics, which is arguably kind of bad practice. So now everything is done through the REST RESTful API. So when CCAN itself, houses all the data sets with the ratings for them. It's actually Drupal doing those ratings and just tossing it off to CCAN to handle it. So it's, it's a very tight integration, as I mentioned before. And then the last thing I'll show from this site, something I'm pretty proud about, is all the search pages that we have. Uh, so this is, again, backed by schema. So it, there's, no, there's no chance of anything never validating or going, or if it doesn't match the actual fields you would expect. Um, we have there are about 20 search pages powered through this. The facets are, again, provided through Solar. And what's neat about this page is it doesn't actually, it's not being rendered through a database. It's actually Solar rendering it. So it's actually incredibly performant and rather fast. Um, if we go a bit further, you can see here, I can just request one of the pages. And what is also neat is, based on this request, it's actually going to send all the data from this little form itself into a web form that people inside the Open Canada site can actually see, and then it will let them actually send a response based on the request that was happening. But I think my tether is, I really should have used the on online one. Oh, well. What are you doing? I only have one bar. All right. I'm do settling at one bar. It's not so fine. Uh, so this, again, is web forms in Drupal. So this lets you basically very quickly through a UI create your own web form um, that is most, for the most part, accessible. We've actually went through accessibility at StatsCan for this. And it lets you, through the UI, create a pretty, pretty complicated form that will actually give you validation all the way throughout. And what we've done is to make sure everyone who fills it out, they can only submit once this is everything, everything has been properly filled out. And that's what I would say is for open data. We were working on giving them content deployment, but we didn't make that in time. But for a six-month development frame between two developers, uh, hitting under budget, I think we did fairly well, and all this work has been open sourced and, and brought back to our base distribution, which has been uh, fairly good for that. So I'm just going to go back. And then finally, we have Statistics Canada, which is again a sub profile of WXT, which serves as a front end user engagement portal for StatsCan. We have things like our new dissemination model, blog, question of the month, tailored workflows for department. We even have proper content staging deployment, and we have things like MyStatCan and authenticated apps. I wanted to show actually some elements of this, but I think, oh, wow, okay, my uh, time's getting shorter, so I'm going to go really quick. Let's go. All right, yeah, let's go with Go. Uh, so let's, let me get here. So Go is an open source programming language that is simple to learn, highly performant, and remarkably powerful. It's uh, blazing fast and on par with well-written C, C programs, and you can write Go much faster. The static binaries it builds are incredibly easy to deploy. Um, for some people that may be a Docker people, just think scratch container plus Go app itself, you're less than 10 megs. That's a really efficient way of deploying your application. Uh, you get an incredible amount of freedom with Go, um, as there's, but there is usually only one best practice way of doing something. Um, you don't need to prove how cool you are by doing pointer arithmetic for no other reason than you can with Go. It, it really does live the mantra of do one thing, do one thing well. Um, and then you can build your programs for many different platforms, whether they're Linux, Solaris, Mac, Windows, BSDs, on AM64, Raspberry Pis, truly anywhere. 
Um, and then I just mentioned really quickly that it truly is the language of the cloud. It's efficient and easy to learn, multi-platform, and vol follows the best laid path. Um, so while not an ex exhaustive list, these are a few projects we are actively using and taking into production that are written to go. Just wanted to mention, we will go over Docker and Kubernetes specifically later in the presentation. Uh, so because of my time constraints, I'm not gonna be able to demo a lot of this, but I'll just go through it. We use ACS Engine. ACS Engine is uh, something given to us by Azure. It lets us quickly, via a small uh, JSON spec, instantly bring up a rather complicated Kubernetes cluster, whether it's a Windows Linux hybrid or needs to be custom DNS or custom VNet. We can do this with a really, custom, really small JSON spec and ACS engine will render it for us. Um, and then well, I'll skip that too. I will quick, very quickly show what, how it actually operates uh, and then maybe that'll give a bit of an idea. So this is only two minutes, but I will zoom in for this. So I'm gonna have to fast forward this really quickly. So this is ACS engine, I'm just printing the version. And then what I'm gonna do is just show you what a spec looks like. So right here, I'm just saying, give me Kubernetes, give me Kubernetes at this version, and I want to have tiller, dashboard, and rescheduler with it, and my master profile, I only want one master, and I only want one uh, Linux pool agent, and you're gonna make sure my VM size is a standard D4S, and then what we're gonna do based on that little small JSON is render the full ARM template for us. This is actually infrastructure as code, so what we will do is when this is generated, we'll put this in our Git, Git repo, and we'll make sure that we never lose it, because this actually represents our clusters inside uh, production management and innovation. So it's generating right now. Uh, it will also do all of our certs for us and our SSH keys, which is really good. And then you can see right here, I have all my schemas aligned to the regions, Australia, Brazil, Canada is the one we use. We have our etcd keys, and then we have even our kubectl controllers. This is all in config. Even better though, is we can use uh, Key Vault to even make sure our keys aren't there. So what we do right now is we're gonna deploy that template that just got generated. So we'll just do AZ group deployment under the ACS default namespace and just use our, our, our files that got generated. What this will do in the back end portal of Azure, it will instantly bring up a two node Kubernetes cluster for us and it really wasn't that much effort for us to do. And there's tons of examples and how, on complicated examples and how you wanna bring this up. Uh, we, this is just a base example, but you can see right here in Azure, all my cluster has been brought up. I'm just filtering by it right now. ACS defaults, I got my persistent volume, I got my availability sets, I got my public IP address with very little hassle. And once you get Kubernetes up, then you get the real power. So we're just gonna go outside of this now. I think I'm doing good. Um, so Arc, I'll talk really quickly about. So whenever you're doing Kubernetes or container-driven development, make sure you have a backup strategy. Arc is really good because it manages disaster recovery, uh, backups of your cluster and, and, and it restores. And even one interesting feature is, since Kubernetes can op operate on any cloud, any vendor or on-premise, it will actually let you restore your resources across clouds. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster up in Amazon and you have one up in Azure, Azure has your workloads, you can do workload migration via Arc to your Amazon cluster. Uh, if you aren't using Arc, take a look at it. It's probably one of the best Go, Go programs you can use. Incredibly simple to use. And I think I have another quick example of that. So let's take a look right here. I will have to speed up on this one though. Uh, so Arc Backup Restore. So we're just gonna go really quickly. Da -da -da. So Arc.sh, this is just me deploying it. I don't think we really need to worry about that. This is me coming it up. So what I'm doing here is Arc Backup. I'll show that really quickly again is I'm saying arc backup, create EFK backup. I'm using a selector, so selectors will point to my particular apps. Basically what I'm saying is I want you to back up the Elasticsearch uh, Elk stack for me. And also back up all the persistent volumes that are with it. Uh, so that's interesting that I can do a simple backup for that, but most people will probably want to have a cron. So let's take a look at a further example of a backup. Uh, before I do that though, I'll just mention that because I did this, you should see a, ba a backup quickly show up here. I guess I'm out of sync with my slides. That would be good for that. So we'll just do this right here. It's gonna skip a bit forward because I'm running out of time. So we're gonna go a bit more forward. So this is just showing you roughly what an ARC backup looks like. It will show you all the resources it's doing. You can even see that it was backing up my persistent volumes. And I'm going a bit too fast. And then we'll go. So we're still deleting. I just wanna show you guys the cron one that I'm gonna skip over the rest. Perfect. So this is an example of a cron backup. So right here I'm saying with ARC, create a schedule, here, selector for my app, snapshot all the volumes, but do it on this type of cron. And it, it, it works really great. All my persistent volumes are backed up for me. Um, and we, we've actually added a problem in one of our production GitLab instances. And thanks to Arc, we were very quickly able to restore it re re relatively painlessly because it's just a simple Arc restore. 
unfortunately, I need to go on again, so let's go. Um, now we have Gra Gra Grafana Prometheus. So this is used for all of our monitoring of our metrics of our cluster. I just gave a quick example. I just embedded some of our metrics right here. You can see it tells us the health of all of our containers, how much um, this is the current memory, and what else is going on. So I'll just quick, very quickly show you the actual Grafana itself. So let's go. Just one second. So here's a Grafana. I'm just going to go into our KH dashboard. Uh, so what is really neat, this was, took, took, took no effort from our part. All we need to do is install Prometheus, Prometheus in the cluster. That will instantly give us all the metrics. We toss off all the metrics to Grafana, and then we just really quickly created the dashboard that's going to give you metrics for everything, whether it's your top 10 hungry pods, your top CPU, top, top CPU network I.O., and disk I.O. Grafana is very, very good for Kubernetes infrastructure and to manage that. So we're just going to go back now again. And then probably closest to my heart is traffic. Uh, if you aren't using traffic, you really should. It's not just for Kubernetes. Uh, I'm just going to actually go a bit further because I want to actually talk about that specifically. Da, da, da. And where are you? Almost there. And yeah, so traffic is a modern HTTP reverse proxy and load balancer that makes deploying microservices easy. Traffic integrates with your existing infrastructure components, Docker, Swarm, Kubernetes, Marathon, Console, etcd, Rancher, on and on, Amazon ECS, and configures itself automatically and dynamically. Imagine you develop a bunch of microservices with the help of an orchestrator like Swarm or Kubernetes, or even a service registry like etcd or Console. Now you want users to access these microservices, and you need a reverse proxy to do it. Uh, traditionally, reverse proxies require that you configure each route that will connect paths and subdomains to each microservice. But in an environment where you add, remove, kill, upgrade, or scale your services many times a day, this just isn't pra practical. So this is where traffic can kind of help you. So I'm just unfortunately I can't really go through all the features that traffic gives you, like SSL termination, circuit breakers, WebSocket, HTTP/2, gRPC. But it it has pretty much all the the fun stuff that developers really like. And you'll notice that we at Stats actually used traffic quite extensively. So what I'm going to do right here is just take you to our K8 node. This is our production interface. Uh, it is passworded, but I logged in through. So what this shows you is that in, in our Kubernetes cluster, we have things like Artifactory up. Our front end Artifactory is pointing to our back end container. Same thing with our data viz pages, GitLab itself, Grafana, Jenkins, Mattermost, Prometheus, and traffic itself, which is rendered up here, and then X-Ray. Uh, so that's that. But then we also, since we have many clusters, we also have a dev test and an innovation cluster. So I can go right here and do the same thing and just switch it out to traffic.inno and then you'll see our traffic that actually manages our internal innovation one. This one's going to have some broken de developments because what we do is we actually let the developers use this as is and, and actually try things and break things and try whatever application they want to deploy of traffic. It's actually been a kind of a mission enabler for a lot of people because they're not really blocked on tech anymore. You want a Python? You want to do some work in Python, just bring it up as a container. Uh, we'll help you package it up as a Helm chart so you can get persistent volumes from the cloud. You get a full app lifecycle, and it really didn't take that much work. So we're just going to go back. Oh my god, OK. Uh, so went over that. I'm going to skip over Hugo. Hugo is a static site generator written in Golang. We do, we do provide WXC support for it. Take a look at WetBow, WetBow Hugo. We are going to work on uh, WetBow 5 for that soon. Uh, Vault, unfortunately, I'll have to skip to. Very cool tech. If anyone wants to take a look, this is really useful for distributed key secrets. Um, it could do a, a bunch of other nifty things, like if you have a settings.php file in Drupal that has all of your credentials in it, Vault can do rolling credentials for you and actually update the template itself. Uh, so de definitely take a look. Um, Mini, I will talk about very, very quickly, because it's actually us at StatCan developing our own Go app. Uh, so let's just mention what it does. Uh, so how does it work? Well, first you have your pre-release data in, let's see, an SSC control data center. You then want to securely upload your data into a private secured storage blob file container in the cloud. Mini can handle gigabytes of data with ease, and with high concurrency, use all of the available pipe that is given to you. Mini copies requests thousands of parallel, and then at a certain time commits them. This commit happens by all the files already uploaded to the cloud being manually moved to a public file container, a blob file container, which is efficient due to, the, due to most cloud storage accounts available bandwidth. Uh, Mini will be publicly released soon on our github.com stack can, and we are hoping to add support for many more clouds other than Azure. Shout out to some of the pretty amazing gophers that I know are in the room. So we're going to go a bit further. All right. So we're finally at cloud native. Uh, so, oh my god. Okay, we're going to really try to go face through this. So no one really has to know much here. Uh, this is just to say cloud native is huge, and CNCF gives you the best of breed of what's in cloud native. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out how to... 
go through this quickly. Uh, cloud native infrastructure is infrastructure that is hidden behind useful abstractions, controlled by APIs, managed by software, and has the purpose of running applications. Running infrastructure with these traits gives rise to a new pattern for managing the, that infrastructure in a scalable, efficient way. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to go through further what that is. Um, I will very quickly, though, mention what cloud, what cloud native is not. Uh, cloud native infrastructure is not only running infrastructure in a public cloud. Just because you rent server time from someone else does not make your infrastructure cloud native. The processes to manage IaaS are often no different than running a physical data center. Cloud native is not only about running application in containers, though it does help. Uh, when Netflix pioneered cloud native infrastructure, almost, almost all of its applications were deployed with virtual machine images, not containers. Uh, the, the way you package your applications does not mean you will have the scalability and benefits of autonomous systems. That's often where Kubernetes comes in. Um, it also doesn't mean you only run a container orchestrator. Kubernetes and Mesos, such as Kubernetes and Mesos. Containers orchestrators provide many platform features needed in cloud native infrastructure, but not using the features as intended means your applications aren't dynamically scheduled to run on a set of servers. And then finally, cloud native is not about microservices or infrastructure as code. Microservices enable faster development cycles on smaller distinct functions, but monolithic applications can have the same features that enable them to be managed effectively by software and also benefit from cloud native infrastructure. So I'm just going to go on for that. I'm going to ignore what the traits are. The traits basically establish how, through the CNCF initiative, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, they've taken all those what is in cloud native and made sure to align uh, to, the, to the spec. So we're just going to go next. All right, this is the good part. Da, 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 da. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is an open source software foundation dedicated to making cloud native computing universal and sustainable and something I truly believe the government should be embracing, not only because it perfectly aligns with our open first policy on cloud computing. Cloud native computing uses an open source software stack to deploy applications as microservices, packaging each part into its own container and dynamically orchestrating those containers to optimize resource utilization. The CNCF serves as the vendor, vendor neutral home for many of the fastest growing projects on GitHub, including Kubernetes, currently number two on GitHub, by the way. The only thing more popular is Linux, uh, Prometheus, and Envoy. Uh, so fostering collaboration between the industry's top developers, end users, and vendors. So these are all the products at StatsCan that we use the, from CNCF that we use. Kubernetes, Helm, which is the package manager for Kubernetes, Prometheus, CNI, which handles our networking layer, gRPC, which is actually used for an efficient remote procedure call, and we are taking a look at Rook, which is used for container native storage. So it's going to go. So now that I have to skip that, let's get that. So at this point, I thought I would just quickly plug our monthly cloud native meetups at the GOC. Uh, this meetup consists of a group of people interested in improving government digital services through cloud native design. For our purposes, cloud native design refers to the architectural design, deployment, and operation of apps. We try to learn and share our, our experiences of building highly distributed applications via a microservice approach that can scale on demand. This is facilitated, obviously, through the use of containers, Docker, uh, which helps you build, ship, and run applications anytime and anywhere. Containers ensure agility, portability, and control for all your distributed apps. Additionally, um, I will shortly discuss how we orchestrate containers via Kubernetes, which has become the industry standard for scheduling and orchestrating containers at scale. Um, so any skill level, level is welcome, and every, and every month we encourage people to submit their own demos and host the meetup. Oh, oh. So just mentioning what we talked about, some past meetups. We talked about container architect, architecture, Kubernetes orchestrator, Azure ACS, AKS, is, we're pretty much on Azure, although we did procure Amazon at stats as well. Terraform, Jupyter Hub, gRPC, protobuffers, and we've mentioned Artifactory X-Ray. Um, at our future meetups, though, we're, we are going to be lucky enough to have the GC tool teams come because they've been doing a lot of container-centric development for a while now. We will also have some people from OpenShift come as well. Uh, they'll be doing a demo of how OpenShift runs and works. We, are, we actually managed to snag that traffic maintainer I mentioned earlier. He's going to be coming to a future meetup. Uh, we're also going to have an Azure uh, representative come talking about Windows containers. We'll have um, Bernard Malte from SSC coming discussing Rancher Cattle. And then we'll have some things of Terraform with GitLab CI. I should also mention we, did we will have a meetup on October 4th as we managed to snag a member, a maintainer of uh, Cube Hunter and Cube Bench from Acquia Security, which deals with uh, container security. And they'll be talking about open source adoption, dev advocacy, and the security around containers. So I'm just going to go a bit further. Unfortunately, due to time, I'm going to have to skip the containerization, containerization section, but all my slides are up at govcloud.ca. Uh, if you just go to govcloud.ca slides, you'll see everything here. So just Docker's great. You can easily get it. Docker plus Kubernetes with Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows. You don't have to do anything. Just install the Docker app. You also get Kubernetes for free. 
so then, v also I should mention VS Code has great integration with Docker. So does Visual Studio. It's, uh, my, it truly is a different Microsoft. They embrace containerization like I haven't seen. Um, so you'll get Docker file code completion, Docker Compose support, generation of Docker files. Um, it works with Docker Hub and it gives you linting. And um, then very quickly, I just want to mention that Windows does love Docker. There is a, actually a white paper written by them on azure.com slash container, I believe. Um, it's a 70-page document on how you do Windows, application, uh, Windows container application life cycles. And it actually takes you from step A all the way to step Z. Uh, Docker enables a full ecosystem of tools on Windows, whether it's through PowerShell, Docker Hut, data center, and it even gives you true multi-tenant isolation via Hyper-V. Um, and just recently, they've added Active Directory support right inside the container, which is rather huge for .NET developers. Um, then I have to skip through that. I was going to give you an example of what a Windows Docker file looks like, showing how we're actually proxying all of our containers and packages through Artifactory and X-Ray. Uh, this is neat because it will actually scan every single package that we're building against all known CVEs in the wild. Artifactory is really useful for us. Uh, so then we're going to go here to what I consider magic. Uh, so Kubernetes, I think. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> How much time do I still have? <laughs> but, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'll just quickly go over this quickly and mention this. So we we do as a government. The government is aligning to Kubernetes. It does align with government strategic direction. SSC, CSC, CSIS, CDS, SDC. Uh, all of us, at one form or another, are using Kubernetes. We're using um, AKS at, uh, at a StatsCan. Um, I know a few others are using OpenShift. Pivotal also is, has a great Kubernetes offering, so I highly encourage you to take a look at it. And if you are wondering what Oracle's doing, Oracle's new cloud infrastructure, guess what it's running on? Kubernetes. There is standardization around this. Uh, I really can't stress enough. Please integrate with this, uh, this framework. This is really where you want to be because with Kubernetes, you can actually write it once and it will work on any cloud or on-premise. Save yourself time and just uh, deal with that. And then I was going to go mention all the charts we have at use at StatsCan that we've helped develop. You can just take a little look, see here, and see all the ones we've done. Uh, we use a, fairly a lot, like Artifactory X-Ray, Drupal as well. Um, I was going to go through a bit of app, what app delivery looks like. So I'll just really quickly just show a quick look. So everything we have in Helm, you can actually install full, full application deployments uh, via Helm on Kubernetes. And this is a little interface that lets you select any application you want. It will install all the load balancers, all the persistent volumes. You can install SAS, Drupal, and deploy it at a click of a button onto your cloud provider. It's incredibly efficient. And then, well, let's go on. I think I'm almost done. We also use Jenkins rather heavily and GitLab rather heavily. Unfortunately, I won't have time to show you the full GitLab CI CD, but suffice to say, we are able to do a pull request to Drupal, bring it up in a pull request, actually build it as a container, actually then bring up Drupal itself as an app, but based on that pull request. And then give us a special ingress that has the branch and the, and the Git hash inside, inside it. I'll just show that very quickly. I can probably show that. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, I do encourage anyone to take a look, but you can see right here that I have a review branch that got brought up based on a pull request, and then if I click it, it's going to take me right to my Drupal environment at an interesting URL. So I'm just going to go here and just show you that, and then I'll end it with that. Uh, so right here, you can see we have WCMS site SDC review 8.x and then a hash. So this is us based on a pull request, bringing up an environment that quick, people can quickly look at, tear it down, and this is all done through GitLab CI. Take a look at the full video, we show this in, in detail. And then a bit further, we were, I was going to show you our X-Ray and Artifactory. Take a look at the videos. This is our full DevSec ops pipeline. It shows you how whether it's R, CRAN, Python, PHP, or even Docker, it goes through Artifactory, and then it's scanned by X-Ray, and it, it reports all known CVEs uh, to our organization. This is what's going to enable us to use open source software effectively. Um, so if you take a look right here, I'll just show this quickly. Um, just, this is just showing the full configuration of how to set it up. But if I go further, I'm just going to set a watch for Docker, and then I'm going to show you that it's going to hopefully find... Uh, this isn't the right slide. Um, suffice to say, I can... If I have to, uh, after this uh, session, if people are curious, I can show you X-Ray and actually show you how it's doing scanning and the, and the deep level of inspection it does. Uh, this actually shows you we can even do license reports too. So it will scan all your packages, whether open source or not, and give you a report on the type of licenses you're using. Very useful, uh, especially for government. And then we use Octopus, which is a type of deployment uh, uh, application that facilitates CI/CD. Uh, I, I won't have time to go through that. 
and one time to go through that. And then I was just going to mention quickly serverless. Last slide, I promise. Um, serverless is an interesting direction. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll keep it simple and just say it's context sensitive when you should use serverless technology. It's very variable type workloads, things that are more ethereal in, in their type of approach. There's a bunch of pros and cons for each, but uh, you should take a look at Knative. This is a Kubernetes approach to serverless. Um, so uh, not one to be outdone. Kubernetes is not going to be outshined in any way. Um, so it's going to actually be promoted to CNCF soon. It gives you full build, serving, and eventing, like AWS Lambda and all that. But it's going to be a true Kubernetes uh, universal control plane. All the clouds are going to support this. And if you're a, a real serverless guy, you might ask that, wait, hey, wait, hey, you're on Kubernetes, so it's still technically a managed service. Well, in the new Azure, they're actually letting you have masterless Kubernetes, and they're going to be introducing a thing called nodeless Kubernetes. The moment that happens, you no longer are even operating your Kubernetes structure. You're just working with it, and that is the definition of serverless. Take a look at Knative, and particular Istio. Istio is going to let you have routed traffic. So you can say things like, I want 30% of my traffic to go to this set of containers, the other 70% going here, and it also facilitates blue-green deployment. This is what's going to make StatsCan a uh, next generation department for the and actually attract uh, a lot of great developers. Uh, sorry for the pace I went through, but this gives you hopefully a bird's eye view of what we're doing at Stats. We are looking for open source developers. Um, please take a look at jobs.gc.ca, and if you uh, have a, re a resume, please include your portfolio. That is what really matters to us. We like seeing good, the code you've done, and that is likely what gets you through the door. Um, again, we're really looking for open source talent. Please apply. Thank you. Thank you, Will, and Andrew, and Laurent. Whew. I'm exhausted. My goodness. I think I need a cocktail after that. No, I'm just kidding. Will, I think next time you need a little bit more enthusiasm, okay? <laughs> that was awesome.